Hi, everybody. A warm welcome to the new patient engagement open forum, the last one before the summer. And we open it with a session on understanding learnings guidances. What do we know so far on the use of patient experience data PET, for healthcare decision making? So welcome everybody. Uh, next slide, please. I'm Nicholas Brook. Um, and actually you, you are not expecting me today and I'm replacing um, Jessica Scott. Uh, she had a family emergency uh, and I'm jumping in to actually help moderate uh, our panel today. Next slide, next slide, please. And I just wanted to say a quick word about Jessica because it's really unfortunate that she cannot join us today. She has been investing a lot of time uh, in preparing this session. And uh, also I wanted to acknowledge the, the great role she plays uh, actually uh, uh, in multi-stakeholder environment like the Patient Engagement Open Forum, PFMD or other piece of work like uh, Eleanor will present us today. Uh, and she's really taking a very active role on progressing anything related to patient experience data. So really unfortunate she cannot be with us. And I hope it will be only uh, for next time that uh, we, we can have her uh, with us. Now, uh, next slide, please. We have, um, so we are here together as part of the Patient Engagement Open Forum. And, and so basically the, the whole aim of this platform is to, to bring many stakeholders and a diverse audience together to make sure that we move towards stronger patient engagement and that we bring a quite holistic perspective to the table. So very often, what uh, if it's your first time you, you should witness today is that uh, we have very diverse uh, type of uh, uh, inputs, perspectives, uh, knowledge, uh, level of expertise, and actually that's what, that's what makes these sessions very, very rich. Next slide, please. So just a, a few rules for today. So uh, the goal is to, to have you connected to our discussion, to engage, to ask questions. I'll come back to that. Uh, microphones, uh, apart from the speaker, uh, will be muted. Uh, we will have a Q&A function. The chat will be open also to maximize the, the, the way to interact. Uh, the session is recorded. Um, and uh, so we will, we have built uh, the, the session so you can interact all along. Next slide, please. Regarding the Q&A, uh, a few, so you see, you, you have a, an icon at the bottom of your screen. You can um, actually uh, ask any question. We try to answer any uh, question that come, but it will be probably impossible given the number of attendees we have in the audience today. Uh, think about uh, asking questions in the Q&A. Uh, with the chat, it will be difficult to track all the questions and, and to bring them in the right time uh, for discussion. Next slide, please. And so with this, uh, I open uh, the, the floor to our three speakers, and I'm actually very, very happy about uh, them because they, each of them will bring, will bring a very specific aspect and enrich the discussion we have started uh, a couple of months ago in PF uh, and actually enrich the discussion and help us continue our journey towards better patient engagement in patient experience data. So with this, I will start with uh, Michelle, who is uh, connecting with us uh, from California. So it's super early. Thank you very much, Michelle, to be with us. Would you like to tell us uh, a little bit about you and what's your hope for today? Sure. I'm Michelle Tarver. I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of Strategic Partnerships and Technology Innovation at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And our office is focused on bringing the patient's voice into the medical device evaluation project product. Um, process, excuse me. Um, I am hoping for today that we'll be able to share with you some of the work that we're doing in this space, as well as what we envision can happen in the future with respect to bringing the patient experience data into medical device evaluation. Thank you, Michelle. Brett, what would be your hope today? Uh, hi, I'm Brett Halber, um, Senior Director in a group called Global Medical Impact Assessment at Pfizer and a preference researcher primarily. And my hope today um, is to kind of take stock of where we are because I feel like we are developing a critical mass of experience and um, activity. 
and it feels like things are going to start breaking loose here and that's pretty exciting time so i think taking stock today is a great thing to do thank you brett and we will hear a bit more about that later eleanor welcome back in pf uh, what's your hope today you are muted about that uh, thank you nicholas um, I am Eleanor Perfetto. I'm the Executive Vice President for Strategic Initiatives with the National Health Council. I'm also a professor in the School of Pharmacy at the University of Maryland. And um, I am fortunate to be a board member for patient-focused medicines development. And um, I, I want to echo some of the things that my colleagues, Michelle and Brett, said. I think today, um, if we can have everyone who's in the audience walk away with a sound understanding that there are some exciting things going on right now, in terms of capturing and, and actually making the best use of and optimizing the input that we get from patients. Um, that, that's, a, 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 as, as Brett said, it's a tipping point for us. We're really seeing that this is not just being talked about, but it's starting to really happen. And if everyone can walk away with an appreciation for that today, um, I think they'll find that it's very exciting, but they'll find that there are great opportunities. Thank you very much, Eleanor. And indeed, and today we would like to materialize this tipping point that you are yeah, describing, but also empower the audience to go back uh, and with the awareness, but uh, some learnings and some ideas on how to support that tipping point as well. Um, so next slide, please. We, we will start uh, our session today um, uh, with uh, basically uh, a quick setting the scene uh, to remind what we discussed in the last session um, and to maybe position a little bit what we could observe, like how can we, what are the indicators of this uh, tipping point that Eleanor just mentioned? Uh, and then uh, each of our panelists will uh, have a, a presentation uh, of the work they have been driving, uh, exploring and experiencing uh, and share this experience with, uh, with us today. Uh, and you will see uh, there will be a very nice uh, build up of the different uh, aspects. Uh, and from there, we'll have a, a Q&A session with the panel, and then we will enter into an inside gathering activity where you will all be asked to actually uh, input and engage uh, in a discussion building on some uh, material that uh, Eleanor will present. And that will be our co-creation session uh, for, for today before we we go to some uh, concluding remarks uh, and continue the, the afternoon. Next slide, please. So we will start as we uh, used to do in the PF session with a, a group map uh, that you can uh, open. It's highly recommended to open it from a computer. It's uh, way easier to, to engage. Um, the link should appear very soon uh, in the in the, the chat box and uh, you have to enter your address email and basically we'll simply start uh, with a uh, one question before we get into the, the presentation uh, about which stakeholder, stakeholder group you belong to. Can you go to the next slide, please? So you have the link in the chat uh, and uh, you have it on the screen as well. Um, and um, let's, uh, I'll give you a, a couple of minutes to enter the group map, open it, enter your email, and just clarify which group you belong to. And maybe as the, uh, we can see the result already. Maybe uh, for the sake of time, I will just check to see if the numbers are growing fast. Should be okay. We try to reach the 60 participants that have logged into group map. Uh, 
We'll come back to it a little bit um, later. For the moment, we have a, quite a presentation from industry. We have researchers on boards, investigators, and academic. That's great. Patient organizations um, and patient advocates are caregivers. Uh, so uh, that's quite a presentation. We have CROs on board and medical devices companies. Uh, so maybe just go up to the screen Nicole, please so i can see the numbers before we get started just want to check if we have a nicole can you go a little bit up thank you just sweet i don't think the the representation will change that much at this stage so we will continue to capture your answers and we will move on with the presentation at this stage. So can we go back to the slide, please, and go to the next slide? Thank you very much. So we had a se session back in April uh, with the panelists that you see on the screen and just very quickly, um, uh, a couple of points emerge uh, from that session. So the first thing was the need to, of a clear definition. And I will actually, uh, as a reminder or as a support, I would just uh, uh, put on the screen uh, some definitions from FDA in, in the next few minutes uh, to help uh, set the stage for this discussion. Uh, we also had the discussion that uh, this knowledge, this uh, data, this um, understanding of the patient experience actually could serve many other decision points uh, beyond uh, the life cycle of uh, medicine and regulatory phase. So that's something to take into account. Uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, the, the multi-stakeholder aspect of it, just to make sure that one, the patient perspective is very well represented, but also other professionals like healthcare professionals could actually benefit. Uh, and that was one of the input from Richard uh, at the extreme right on, on the screen uh, to actually explain how he could benefit and completely redesign his practice based on patient experience data that he initially didn't design for his uh, purpose. Um, and then finally, the, the need for communication and transparency uh, of this data uh, and sharing of this data. So that were the, the key point of that session. And so before we start to build on the session today, a few elements to illustrate the tipping point so we can go to the next slide. What you have on the, the next slide is actually um, a timeline um, designed at the time by um, NHC. Uh, and you can see more or less 27 years of uh, patient engagement milestones starting very early in 1992. Uh, and you can see quite some events uh, in Europe, in the US, um, led by patient organizations, led by regulators or HTAs. Um, and you can see 27 years of um, milestones. Now, if you move to the next slide, uh, we wanted to see uh, what's happening in the, in the last 24 months this time. And you see, you can see it's nearly as busy uh, for 24 months. And actually, if you look at some of the key milestones uh, there on the screen, uh, so the, you, have, um, uh, you can see also that it starts to be more and more explicit in terms of guidances and expectation from the, the public health authorities, whether it's regulators, whether it's Europe, whether it's the US. Um, so, so basically, uh, whether it's payers, uh, and so basically, I think that's one of the, the indicators that uh, Eleanor and Brett um, highlighted in the introductions. And so I will not go through all the, the one that, uh, that you have on the screen, but we have selected um, a couple of quotes coming from uh, actual publication or guidances from these uh, public health authorities uh, and showing this transition. And so, I will, I will take one of the most recent one uh, in the middle at the bottom from uh, the UK uh, regulator um, insisting on the fact that um, the applicant will have to show uh, evidence on the patient involvement activities. And so really explicitly um, 
in the guidances for sponsor to submit files. And so you will see, uh, and we will share the slide after the meeting. Uh, so you, you will see that actually most of these quotes are going exactly in the same direction. You can see that there is also uh, this understanding from the regulators uh, with some impulse coming from the FDA, but also other impulse from EMA where they clearly articulate that they, will, they are evolving the approach to patient data and patient involvement. And actually they will actually work together through ICH uh, to harmonize regulatory approach across the, the globe as the, the purpose of ICH. So really important to see that um, what uh, used to be a wish uh, is actually turning into real expectations uh, by regulators. Next slide, please. Now, uh, from the FDA perspective, there are some definitions. Um, uh, we have decided for today uh, to, to, to show this one. Uh, and so it's very explicit already. Uh, and so you have, um, uh, so it's very broad as well as a definition. Uh, so it's a data collected by any individual uh, and it includes patient experience, perspective, needs and priorities. And so that's why also we highlighted the box at the bottom right, because the, the relative importance of any issues as defined by patient is one of the things we'll discuss a lot today. Uh, so um, we, we have highlighted that box. Next slide, please. You also see on this slide, the table on the right, which is actually a table as part of the FDA application where there is a very explicit uh, description and categorization of patient uh, experience data. Uh, and it includes the, uh, the, the PRO part, of course, as part of COA, but it also includes qualitative studies and other aspects. And it also articulates, for example, that some data can be submitted not necessarily by the sponsor. Uh, so it, uh, some other um, initiative can submit data to actually support uh, a submission. And so today, what we know is that over 90% of um, submission are including uh, patient experience data. Uh, we know that the huge majority of that experience data is actually uh, PROs. And we also have um, a strong perception from the patient community that yes, we have this great proportion of patient reported outcome, but the quality of them and the patient settledness of them is still uh, something to be assessed from a patient perspective. And so I think that's something that Elona will build on a little bit later on uh, today. Next slide. One thing we wanted to insist on is the fact that there is really a, a, a sequence to patient experience data. And so the very first thing is to, to build it from the real patient experience and to make it as holistic as possible. And Eleonore, we will have a, a presentation of the work that uh, NAC is really driving uh, on this aspect today. And, and from there, um, how we turn this information and this experience into relevant data for, for research uh, is and actually the, the content that you see in the middle column is directly from, from FDA, but is how, what, how we can turn that into uh, meaningful indicators and matrix uh, is the, the second step to then decide who are the, the users of uh, that data, what decision uh, makers can actually use it and when uh, uh, based on the first two steps. So it's really important to remember that. Uh, we have seen in the last few years, a lot of debates very often stuck in methodologies, tools, um, and practices, but losing sight of the primary purpose, which is to really reflect the patient experience. Next slide, please. So something that was identified and present in the patient engagement open forum already last year, is that in order to progress this question of patient experience data, patient engagement in patient experience data and the quality of this data, uh, there were four pillars or four key aspects to, uh, to make it happen. So uh, culture, process, tools, and cross-organizational alignment, uh, very important to make sure that uh, the various practices or data set that are used are 
are interoperable, that can be used by different entities, that we speak the same languages, and that we can actually build on works from the rest of the ecosystem and don't work in silos. And that these are four points that I think we still talk a lot uh, today. And can we go to the next slide? So with this introduction, uh, I will scan quickly uh, all your comments and questions and uh, come back to that in the FAQ in the end. But with this introduction, I would like to pass it to, to Michelle. And, and Michelle, please tell us a little bit more about what you are doing in the context of devices and how you feel it's uh, progressing the agenda. Thanks very much, Nicholas. And I'll have the next slide. And thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you about the work that we're doing in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health to bring patient experience data into the medical device regulatory decision-making process. Next slide, please. Our experience with patient um, input really was catapulted in 2016 with our strategic priority of partnering with patients. We set, gave our staff two goals. First, to promote a culture of meaningful patient engagement, um, not only for within our walls, but also outside of our walls. And secondly, to increase the use and transparency of patient input as evidence in our decision making. And I want to share with you a little bit about what we've done to accomplish that. Next slide. Patients. Um, input can come from various different sources. You've heard a little bit during the introduction about how important it is to hear directly from patients about their experiences, whether it be anecdotal reports or um, patient engagement forms. But it's also important that um, we collect it in a well-defined, structured way that it can be used as scientific evidence, such as a patient-reported outcome measure um, that may be collected during the clinical trial, which is a measure of how patients feel and function as they're interacting with the investigational product. Patient preference information is slightly different. It gives a reflection on hey, how patients value the benefits and risks that are associated with the treatment, as well as the treatment alternative and how they're willing to make those trade-offs in some cases. So this information can be useful, but in a slightly different way than patient-reported outcome measures are. And then the new kit on the block is patient-generated health data. This information is the information that we collect day-to-day -day often uh, on our wrist through our smart watches and sensor-based technologies. It also can be from patient-driven registry platforms where patient organizations are more empowered to collect their own information. And we're also seeing it in social media sites where patients are entering discussion forums and, and, and discussing how they're interacting with different medical products. Next slide, regardless of which format the patient input is being collected, it can be useful across the total product life cycle. Patients can really let us know where there are unmet needs that are, being, that are not being um, met with the existing technologies um, or products available on the market. And this can inform the discovery and ideation phase for medical products. Patients, particularly those that are using devices at home, can give us insights in terms of how the device can be designed in a way that is more user-friendly and, and, and can augment the user experience. Patients can be critical advisors in the design of clinical trials, helping to design trials that are patient-centric and patient-friendly, also trials that measure the outcomes that are important to patients. At the regulatory decision-making phase, patient input can be critical. You heard me talk before about patient preference information. So how patients weigh the benefits and risks associated with the treatment can be put into the totality of evidence that FDA considers when making their benefit-risk decision. Patient input can be quite useful in helping us understand how to communicate benefit risk information. And patients can be part of the boots on the ground surveillance system, letting us know when there are challenges happening with any medical product. So you see, it is not a one time, one stage. It is throughout the process. Next slide. And the way that we've been taking steps to try to make sure that we bring, uh, show evidence of how it's had an impact is um, by sharing. Uh, and, and one thing that we've seen is over the past few years, we went from no studies on patient preference information to now 24 industry-sponsored regulatory patient preference studies that have been either completed or in the pipeline. And they've had direct impacts on our regulatory decision. We've had a study that looked at the benefit risks uh, and how patients weigh those benefit risks associated with an obesity device and what trade-offs they were willing to make. And that helped to inform our regulatory uh, benefit risk decision-making for a novel obesity device that came on the market back in 2015. We also saw patient preference information. Let us know the um, maximum acceptable risk that patients were willing to accept for 
easier access to a home hemodialysis device, and it led to an expanded label vindication. The last example I'd like to share with you is that we had a sponsor do a patient preference study to help set a performance goal for a clinical trial by helping us understand what is the minimal acceptable benefit that the patients would be willing to accept for the risk associated with that device. All of these examples show the ways in which patient input can be useful at various stages in the pipeline. In addition, we've seen over 50% of our patient, our, excuse me, our pre-market authorizations, our humanitarian device exemptions, and de novos include a patient-reported outcome measure. And this is a consistent measure for our studies. Next slide. So I'd like to share with you a little bit about what we're doing to help foster this consistent regulatory review and show how we're living by our tagline of being inspired by patients and driven by science. This slide exemplifies the various benefit risk guidances that start at the pre-market all the way through the post-market phase. And every single one of these guidances talk about the importance of including the patient perspective in that benefit risk decision-making process. Next slide. We also have patient-focused guidance documents. One is the patient reported outcome uh, guidance documents, which I'm sure you all are very, very familiar with. As you know, this is currently um, being uh, revamped and, and this is being revamped uh, by multiple centers uh, through the patient focused drug development guidance series led by CEDA. The patient preference guidance is also a final guidance that lays out some recommendations to industry if they're interested in doing a patient preference study. Next slide. Next slide, please. So I want to share with you one of the, uh, the draft guidance of patient-reported outcomes that we um, shared from the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Please go to the previous slide. Um, this draft guidance uh, laid out some of the principles for selecting, developing, modifying, and adapting patient-reported outcome instruments to use in the medical device evaluation process. It's really uh, meant to be complementary to some of the PFDD guidances, but it, it states what is important to patients, you should measure that, ensure that they understand the tools that are being used to collect the patient reported outcome measures, and convey clearly how that tool is going to be used in the protocol, as well as a statistical analysis plan, stating a priori uh, how it will be used. Leverage existing information and not recreate the wheel if it's not necessary. We also encourage the consideration of alternative platforms and parallel development, understanding that you can use, use some of these efficiencies to greater increase uh, the inclusion of patient um, reported outcomes in the medical device submission. Then we also encourage pre-competitive collaboration, knowing that it, it may be better for everyone to work together, create a tool that everyone can use, and that would save uh, not only in terms, in terms of cost and time, but also potentially in terms of um, translatability to the healthcare delivery sector. Next slide. The patient preference guidance also is another way that we've tried to communicate our, our thinkings to the public about how to do a well-designed, well-conducted study. There are three, three, three themes that are highlighted in this guidance. The first is that it's all about patients, that it follows good study design, and that it's conducted and analyzed in a robust manner. Next slide. We've disseminated these findings through the public science workshops, and you can see we've got um, a lot of attendees attending our workshops over the past year. Thankfully, the virtual platform has facilitated that. Next slide. Next slide. And we have boot camps that allow attendees to come and get hands-on experience on how to measure pay outcomes that are meaningful to patients using digital health technology. It gives them the opportunity to roll up their sleeves, work with FDA staff that have expertise in this, and learn where there can be challenges as well as uh, opportunities to incorporate this into their device development pipelines. Next slide. We have the medical device development tool program that also allows us to have efficiencies by putting forward uh, well-developed tools um, that can be used uh, for a particular context of use, thereby making public where, you, where device development tools may be needed as well as which ones already exist. Next slide. We currently have five tools that have been qualified and two in the pipeline. Next slide. Um, the lessons learned over the years. Next slide. 
And I apologize, it looks like some of the formatting of my slides were changed, so you will fix that before we disseminate it. Um, the first thing that's important is that we should be very clear about the research question and the concept of interest when developing a patient reported outcome. You know, these things are important that, it, that it's clear up front. But it's also important that we consult FDA early and often. Um, often, it's when you're in the design phase of a study or you're developing or modifying or using a patient reported outcome in a clinical investigation, it's, it, it's really important that you talk to us early so that we can give you insights that may help streamline and save you time. Um, it's also important that you involve patients in the development process. We put forward a draft guidance that speaks to the importance of including patients in the design and conduct of a clinical trial. But it's also important in the development of tools and other studies that are going to be used and submitted in a regulatory submission. Having a thoughtful plan for how you want to recruit patients, the patients to align with the indications for use is important. They should come from diverse populations and be generalizable to the study sample. We want to make sure that patients understand the items and the response choices, and that the concepts that are being measured either using the patient reported outcome measure or collected as attributes in the patient preference study um, are ones that align to the clinical trial itself, that things are pre-specified, and that you give the evidence to FDA that can help us assess the quality of the study and the evidence that's, uh, that's been collected so that we can make an informed decision. Next slide. As we move from concept to care, um, I think it's really important to make sure that we highlight the value proposition for patients, that we continue to explore novel applications such as patient-generated health data and the role it can play in helping us understand how medical products are working in the patient community. Again, it's important that we work together in this pre-competitive space to create tools and measures that not only benefit us in the regulatory arena, but also help in the delivery of healthcare. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Next slide. Thank you very much, Michelle. You can see in the background that the sun is rising on your side. So thank you very much to, to do such an early presentation uh, with us. So really appreciate it. Um, uh, we'll move directly to our next speaker. So Brett, um, uh, please share with us your, your direct experience of the tipping point that you have been alluding to. Thank you, Nicolac. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm Brett Hauber again from Pfizer. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, even though I'm an employee of Pfizer, the opinions I'm expressing here are my own based on my, my own experience. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I don't want to give too much history, but I think giving a little bit of history is necessary to see why we're at this tipping point that we're talking about. Uh, if we can click through, there's a little highlighting on this slide. Um, there was a guidance document that was put out by CDRH in uh, initially in 2012. Uh, and this is one of the guidance documents that Michelle referred to. But in that original guidance document, there was this gem about patient tolerance for risk and perspective on benefit and how that is important in benefit risk decision making. And this was sort of the kernel, as I see it, that evolved into much bigger use of patient preference information. So this is, in a way, the beginning. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, as Michelle already mentioned, uh, there is patient preference guidance from CDRH uh, on how to conduct a patient preference study. And in that, what's one of the most important things from my perspective is that we have a definition for what we mean by patient preferences. And currently this is the prevailing definition at FDA and in the subsequent guidance documents that have come, uh, come forward. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and as um, uh, Michelle also mentioned, there are 11 qualities of uh, patient preference studies. Um, that she mentioned, and I see these as guideposts. They are directional uh, and lay out some of the guiding principles for conducting a study. And this is a great foundation. And I think the punchline for my presentation today is what we are seeing is this is a great foundation and we've now begun to evolve beyond that, kind of in the way that Michelle alluded to in, in one of her final slides when she was talking about specific recommendations for uh, developing these types of measures. Go to the next slide, please. 
um, Michelle showed you this slide. This, the, one of the greatest things or the coolest things is these have real impact. We have real case examples where we can show that patient preferences matter and they have made a difference in decisions. And re really six years ago, we didn't have many of these. Uh, since then we are de developing almost this critical mass of studies that allows us to say, hey, this is having an impact. This is how it's having an impact. This is what is working and this is what's not working. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, it's not only happening in the US. There's also movement in Europe. So even though what I'm talking about mostly here today is US focused, uh, based on our experience with FDA, there's also things going on in Europe uh, with EMA. There is a pilot study that uh, was done um, about five or six years ago, and there's been subsequent work um, that kind of indicates that um, EMA is exploring this and they see potential uses for it. And even just last week, uh, presenters from EMA at a DIA, IMI Prefer workshop uh, presented and indicated that there is a way forward for patient preferences in Europe as well as in the US. Next slide, please. Um, you've already seen uh, this in particular. Uh, Nicola showed you if you can hit um, forward, there's some animation here. Um, one of the things I want to point out is when we talk about patient preferences and we talk about patient experience data, we're not talking about separate things necessarily. Patient experience data is, or patient preferences are part of patient experience data. Next slide, please. Um, one of the first, and potentially a very impactful study, I don't wanna say the most impactful study, um, but the first patient experience study that really got a lot of attention was uh, a preference study by Genentech where they did a crossover study of IV versus subcutaneous rituximab, where they asked three questions at two time points after exposure to both. And they asked patients first, which do you prefer? How strong is that preference? And why did you prefer one over the other? And these are the results. And if we can go to the next slide, the impact was that this showed up in section 14.4, the patient experience section of the product label. This was a milestone event um, and very important patient preference as patient experience data in the product label. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the patient experience data or patient experience section of the label is one use for patient preference data. Another use for patient preference data, in addition to the other examples that Michelle demonstrated, is in FDA's um, benefit risk framework. Um, and FDA has demonstrated that there are ways in which to do this, not only related to the benefit risk assessment portion, but also to other places within the benefit risk framework. Next slide, please. So there are two studies that I want to just touch on briefly um, that have happened recently that got to the advisory committees, the two patient preference studies. And I think they're worth noting because they're, they're recent, they're novel, and they're rare so far. Um, if we can go to the next slide. The first one was a study by uh, Janssen. Um, they worked with the Duke Clinical Research Institute to develop a patient preference study for um, to support the new drug application for escatamine nasal spray. Um, they found they measured patients' risk tolerance. They presented this information to the advisory committee. And that was a first, um, something that was submitted with the NDA, presented with an advisory committee is not something you see every day. So this really uh, was a landmark event. And then if we go to the next slide. Um, Pfizer uh, did a preference study that it submitted with its biologic license application for tenezumab. And I have to state that tenezumab is not approved by the FDA. But the study measured patients' preferences when choosing among hypothetical treatments. And FDA addressed this study. And I think this is what is the most important event here that we, we see is 
while they acknowledged that the study followed good research practices, they said, um, the study is not quite right to be informative for regulatory decision-making. And they said, why? And they did that in two ways. They had a presentation uh, by Deborah Marshall from the University of Calgary that said, this is how we implement the 11 good research practices that uh, Michelle and I have both mentioned before. And then um, they provided a review of the patient preference study and they laid out very specifically what it was that they were looking for. And that was a big deal. It takes those guideposts and makes them very specific. So if we go to the next slide. So what we have done is we have summarized those uh, specific recommendations into a checklist. And the checklist will be available when the slides are available. There's really nothing special here other than what we've done is we've just laid out what we heard publicly in those meetings based on that feedback. And if we go to the next slide. The reason I think this is important is this is an example now where FDA has told us specifically, this is what we need to see. This is what's critical to our uh, information needs, what we need to see in order to make our decisions. Um, we don't have a lot of examples of this yet. So I expect to see additional examples, additional feedback, additional guidance come over time. And with regard to Europe, uh, I am my prefer, which is a public-private partnership that is developing recommendations for the use of patient preference studies in HTA and regulatory decision making is developing um, developing those recommendations and has submitted a framework to EMA for a qualification opinion and has included this um, checklist as part of its application. So we expect to see, or I would hope to see, that we get some very specific guidance, we have some very clear direction, and that, we're, that will enable us to see more use of these studies going on. <laughs> Excuse me, next slide, please. Thank you very much, Brett. We'll uh, come back to you to, in the, the Q&A to, to see a little bit how you can, we can interpret it, that signal even further. So, and now we'll pass it down to Eleanor. And, and Eleanor, it's very important to, to position the work you are doing and maybe to relate to a comment that Jan Geisler has done in the chat. Um, uh, it's very important not only that patients understand PROs, but that uh, these are meaningful to patients. So can you maybe introduce your piece of work from, from that comment? You're on mute. Sorry, next slide, please. On the next slide, we can skip over that. Just a reminder, the National Health Council is a US-based organization. And in our membership, we have um, many of the uh, patient advocacy organizations that represent different disease-specific and population-specific organizations. And so through uh, all of these organizations that are in our membership, we like to say that we represent the 160 million Americans with at least one chronic disease and disability um, and do our best to be sure that their voices are heard. Next slide, please. Um, uh, the project that I'm going to describe to you today has an advisory committee, and I just wanna point out the names of the advisors that have been helping us with this. I wanna recognize them because they are making an important contribution to getting this work done. Um, next slide, please. In addition to the advisory committee, I also want to recognize that we have some observers who've been participating with us, and those observers um, are not able to actually uh, be on the advisory committee because of certain restrictions they have within their organizations, but they are participating with us and providing comment when, when um, applicable. Next slide, please. I also want to acknowledge that the project that I'm going to describe to you has some sponsors. In our phase one sponsors, I really want to recognize IBI, the Innovation and Value Initiative, and the Every Life Foundation because they helped us kick off this project. And then more recently, Edwards Life Sciences, Takeda, Pharma, Johnson and Johnson, and Novartis have also um, contributed to keep the project expanding. Next slide, please. 
So before I begin to describe this project to you, I want to describe what it's about because I'm introducing a new concept and some new terminology and that can cause some confusion. Our project is about disease specific patient centered core impact sets. So what does that mean? Um, and this slide depicts uh, the, the, the definition of, of patient centered core impact sets, but I'm going to dig into it a little bit. You see here to the left where all of the little bubbles are, those bubbles represent all of the, um, the potential impacts that a disease or a treatment can have on someone's life. And the blue indicates a direct impact on health or health outcomes. And the gray indicates other kinds of meaningful impacts that could uh, have an implication on someone's life or on the patient's family or on their care partner. And so this is a very large pool of things out there uh, that patients might potentially tell us about the impact of a disease or treatment. And you see this little funnel in the center. Um, we, we can narrow down and winnow down what the most important impacts are by engaging with patients and families and care partners and finding out what's important to them. And then in the end, you'll see this final uh, to the right hand side, this a, a smaller set of bubbles. And we determine what is most important, um, those disease specific impacts or treatment specific impacts that are reported by patients, care partners and families. And that's how we identify through patient engagement and uh, by identifying patient experience data, what are those impacts that are most important? And they can be outcomes, but they can be other kinds of impacts also. Next slide, please. So if we think about how we get to um, a patient-centered core impact set, we have to go through a process. And this process aligns very much with what we were hearing from Michelle and from Brett. So we used patient engagement to identify what's most important to patients. And you see up in the left-hand corner here, uh, what matters most to patients. And this is simply a carryover of what we learned from the previous slide. And then we can uh, also gather information from other stakeholders and by gathering information from the literature, and we put it into a pool of what's most important out there that we should be considering. And we go through some type of prioritization process. And as both Brett and as Michelle talked about, um, this should be a rigorous process. It should be something that's structured and transparent and multi-stakeholder. And we come out with what are the things that are the highest priority that we should be studying um, and or monitoring and care for a particular disease um, or potentially for a particular subpopulations or groups of diseases. And we produce that core impact set. But notice that what patients told us at the beginning was important to them always carries through. We never lose what patients told us. It simply gets prioritized with the other things, but we don't have those things drop out. We carry them forward because that's a very important uh, aspect of capturing the patient's voice. And then we use this core impact set for many possible uses, clinical trials, real world studies, product development, um, quality and auditing, uh, regulatory decision-making. And we, we figure out by, by taking this core impact set what are the right measures that we should be, we be using and what are the uh, potentially the, the, the core set of measures if we can get to that, that core set of measures and endpoints that we would be using in these studies. And this isn't to say that those measures are the same for every single use. They probably have to be uh, structured to be fit for purpose for those uses. But at least we know that in the long run, we're all focusing on the same core impact set and we don't have the wide dispersion that we see today. So to your point uh, earlier, Nicholas, uh, the idea of this is that we must begin with what's important to patients before we figure out what's going to be in this impact set and what those measures should be. The measures shouldn't be um, measures that we've just simply used in the past because they are legacy measures that we carry forward. They should be things that we know are important to patients. Uh, next slide, please. So with that background on what uh, patient-centered core impacts are and what a patient core impact set is, or at least what the goal of that is, I want to tell you about our project um, to get to that goal. Um, we've, decided, we've determined that we've got misalignment, and I think we all recognize this, a misalignment between what patients and their care partners and families say is important to them, and the data that we actually collect. And that leads to misalignment between the existing data, but what our data needs are, because we need to collect data that's important to patients. So due to this misalignment, uh, patients' views are often not considered and the right data are not collected. So we have data gaps that we've identified and we need to fill them. Our objective with this project is to lead a multi-stakeholder effort to create a blueprint and a toolkit 
that the patient community and others can use to develop a patient-centered core impact set for a specific disease, for related diseases, or for a population. Our vision is a smooth pathway for core impact set development by patients and their partners. And we all know that this cannot be done by one group. It has to be done collaboratively. We would like to see it led by patients and patient groups and that they would have partners um, in terms of a consortia that they would put together with multiple patient groups, medical product companies, government entities to be able to, to um, collect these sets and be able to make them available for use for a variety of, of, um, of different uses. Next slide, please. Um, we began this project with an environmental scan. I won't go into the details on that. We'll be putting out more information about that. And anyone who's interested can certainly reach out and uh, contact me. But our scan had a three-pronged approach, literature review, an advisory committee, as I, as I showed you earlier, and a survey of the advisory committee to be sure that we weren't missing anything. Next slide, please. Um, and through that, we were able to collect a variety of data. This is one example I want to show you that um, we have a, an existing core outcome set. So many people are familiar with core outcome sets. And I'm very often asked, what's the difference between an impact set and an outcome set? Core outcome sets in the past, not always true now, but in the past, really concentrated on clinical aspects of a disease and some of those other impacts, but not um, all of them in a comprehensive way. And you see that if we look at an FDA voice of the patient report that came out of a PFDD meeting for hemophilia, there's a whole set of things that patients reported in that meeting that were in this report that talk about different things that patients care about or the impacts on their life that were not captured in a core outcome set. Some of them were, those that are underlined, but many of these were not. These do not overlap at all with what's in the set. And look at what some of them are, caregiver burden, financial impact, social life, family life, residence, where a person lives, career choices. These are the kinds of comprehensive list of impacts that we're trying to get at. And this um, exemplifies what we're talking about when we say core impact sets. Next slide, please. Um, so we also found through this environmental scan four categories of data. And again, I won't go into depth on these, but that the existing information that's out there that can help us with our work is about core outcome sets, patient experiences and preference work, as we heard earlier, that we um, have some existing taxonomies and work to standardize data and some measurement inventories that are out there, but they are um, ad hoc and scattered. And this kind of effort could bring those together. Next slide, please. So in summary, impacts are inclusive of health outcomes, but they go beyond health outcomes. There's no one existing comprehensive approach to capturing these impacts. Past and existing efforts have prim primarily focused on clinical, um, but we wanna get to um, the things that are meaningful to patients and that comprehensive list. There is existing work out there like taxonomies that can serve as a foundation and, um, and we can tap into those. We wanna figure out how do we go from existing core outcome sets to patient-centered core impact sets, sets with patient-centered being um, two of the guiding, guiding words and principles there. Um, we wanna use these sets in research, value-based programs, value assessment and health technology assessment, quality review, et cetera, et cetera. Case studies are going to be required and we will be working on some of those and certainly a multi-stakeholder approach is needed. Next slide, please. Um, our blueprint that we envision, which we are beginning to kick off and work on now, will establish a consensus-based approach for how to do this. And again, bringing in that rigor that Michelle and Brett were talking about. And I think there's much more recognition for much of the qualitative research that needs to be done here. And there wasn't as much appreciation for that in the past. It was called a soft science and was not um, considered as rigorous. And we all know that it is. Um, potentially, we can improve the understanding of data that needs to be collected across diseases, which we don't have a very good understanding about now. And it can increase support and assistance to healthcare stakeholders to identify those impacts that they should be collecting and considering. Next slide, please. For our next steps, we are working on blueprint development that is beginning as we speak. We are working on a toolbox for this and the taxonomy and the cases are certainly part of that toolbox, but we envision there will be other things and we're disseminating information about this effort as we go. And uh, I think that's the end. So we go to the next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eleanor. It's a, it's a great presentation. It's a great combination. Uh, 
device inputs, uh, drug development on the FDA side, uh, and then the impact sets by Eleanor. So thank you very much for all your inputs. We, we have a few questions uh, in the different uh, channels. Uh, maybe I will start uh, because I think it's a clarification question for you, Eleanor. Um, basically, I know you have taken into account the, the work from uh, Icham, uh, but maybe can you describe a little bit to our audience uh, how it relates to it? Yes, so certainly um, the, the ICHOM uh, effort, uh, among others, there's a number of core outcome set development work that's out there. And, um, and what we're trying to leverage all of the work that's been done by these groups. They have lots of, of materials and documentation available based on their experiences and their processes and procedures that they use. And so many of these we will be leveraging. And as I said, um, what we wanna do is we wanna do a few things um, to, that we wanna enhance. One of them is beginning with patients. So always begin this process with input from patients. Past efforts have not begun their process. They've brought patients in. Earlier on, they didn't bring patients in very often. And now more recently over the last five to 10 years, they are bringing patients in to the process. But patients are brought into the process. It's not patients driving the process. We want patients and patient groups to be driving the process. We want the process to begin with patients to make it truly patient-centered. Um, we also want to have a, a concerted effort to be sure that we're capturing all of those impacts. Um, past efforts have focused predominantly on the clinical aspects, and I think that's because they began with clinical input and landscape analysis. Um, we don't want to cast those aside. We think they're very important, but we want patients and patient voice to be the drivers. And then I think we also want to be sure that we're standardizing the approaches that are taken methodologically so that we can be sure that everything is done in a rigorous way and very transparently. And I think that will serve the purpose of meeting the needs of regulators like Michelle and others at the FDA and at the EMA to know that the work is done, done in a rigorous standardized way, um, but in a, in a way that um, is cross-cutting across all of the efforts that we see out there. Thank you very much. I'm sure it will be music to many years in this session today. So starting with the patients, uh, to be really patient-centric. Um, uh, it's a question to all panelists, uh, and I know Michelle can give it a start. Um, so um, any pet ha -ha moment uh, that you would uh, share with the, the audience? So it's a question from Rose. Hi, Rose, good to see you here. Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, in healthcare, we have very much been in a, mat a paternalistic mode um, historically where clinicians, and I'm a clinician, so I'll give that disclaimer up front, drove how healthcare was delivered and administered. What we started to realize, I think, um, is that the preferences, the perspectives, the views of healthcare providers does not necessarily align with that of patients. And regulators also were challenged with that same paradigm shift. I know that we have seen some studies where we thought that patients would value certain outcomes um, in terms of what was targeted for a particular medical product and heard something very different. And, and in some cases didn't know that that was a predominant feature of their clinical profile. So I think there is, we've gotten evidence of the importance, I think, as Eleanor and Brett have both alluded to, of including the patients as part of that conversation, including their priorities as part of that conversation. Because I think at the end of the day, what we're all doing and striving to do is ensure there are products that meet patients' needs and improve the, the lives that they're living. Um, and if there are ways that we can better design or develop or measure that can help them make informed decisions, I think that we've all done our job. And so um, that's, that's one of the things that I, I think uh, has definitely been an eye-opener for me. There were things that I never would have thought would have been a priority or even on the list um, that did show up over and over again in various different studies we've done. Great, thank you. And Brett, I don't know anything to add on that one. Yeah, I'd, um, thanks for the for the question, and and I agree with what Michelle said from the perspective of there are lots of aha moments when when we realize, hey, this is what matters to patients, but there's also been for me a number of aha moments when the pieces seem to come together. And we can say when we know what a patient perspective is and there's a decision to be made and that perspective can inform the decision. This is where those examples that Michelle gave and what we would hope to be in the use of patient preference studies in the future, you know, when, when it 
comes together, it's like magic. <laughs> it's not magic, it's science, but man, it, 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 when it clicks, it clicks. And, and that's because we've aligned the patient perspective with the decision at hand. And, and that's where some of the, the, when we see it work and see how it works, those are great, great aha moments for me. I think, you, I think there are a couple of examples that bring home, things home for, for, for this situation. You saw the hemophilia example I put up, but you know, there was also the, the Jackify example from a few years ago where um, there was an assumption that patients had pain. And when they were asked a pain questionnaire, they didn't report that they had pain. Pain didn't change during the course of the trial because they didn't have pain. They described it in their own words when that when that when when patient engagement and um, and that conversation happened. Their own words were, "It's not pain; it's discomfort. It's a funny feeling. It's a bloated feeling." And when the questionnaire got changed to coincide with what patients were telling the clinicians was was important, then change was recorded because they they actually had a difference in how they felt, and that that change was not in pain. So you learn a lot from the patients. It changes your understanding of the natural history of the disease. You learn more about what those impacts are on the individual patient. Um, and then you can collect the right kind of data. Um, and just in terms of those other impacts that may not be symptom impacts, and there was a question in the chat um, that this might relate to, we very often go around collecting um, data about absenteeism. You know, patients have lost work. They lost hours of work. They lost days of work. They were absent from work. And when you actually talk to patients and you look at some of the voice of the patient reports and hear what they have to say, um, patients are concerned about their loss of work, but they're, they're really concerned about their loss of their job. They're having to change jobs. They're having to cut to being a part-time employee because of their caregiver or losing a career. And those are aspects of absenteeism, what we kind of in a sterile technical way call absenteeism, that are different than what patients report in terms of the impact on their lives, the impact on their psyche because they've lost a career that they were dedicated to. So these are, these are different ways of thinking about some of that information in a broader, in a broader way. Thank you, Elena. And then to me, it resonates a lot as a caregiver, like the, the, the example you are giving, it's, uh, it's quite important. I, I see we, we have a couple of questions still um, in the, the Q&A. Um, we, Peter, we have one question from you, um, and I'm not sure to have the full context to your question. Um, uh, <laughs> what, what that, so basically, you're asking if it makes sense to go to FDA uh, when you're based in Europe. Um, so the instinctive response to that is uh, no. Uh, what's happening maybe more in Europe? Uh, it's, it's, it's less specific at this stage in Europe, but it's coming. And I think if you, have, if you want to have a good understanding of where it's going, I think the two um, initiative that you should look at, and, and Brett, correct me if, I'm, if you think I, I'm wrong, but I would say I might prefer is really uh, setting the scene and the ICH uh, initiative together with the EMA and FDA, where they, they will want to harmonize because the EMA has clearly expressed the intention to use this initiative to, to articulate further what they want to apply moving forward. So Brett, I don't know if you want to add anything to that one. Um, none, uh, no, I agree with you completely. So I really don't have anything to add other than we can put the, um, the website for IMI Prefer, which is kind of the, the portal through which you can see what's going on and get contact with, with everyone um, in the chat, maybe. And, um, but that would be, that's a great starting point. Yeah. If I Thank could just you. add one thing. If the device or the medical product is going to ultimately be intended to be sold in the United States, it may also, um, as well as in Europe, you may also want to have an early conversation with the FDA, even if that's not where you initially want to start, because it may help to streamline some of your development work um, to have that conversation early on. Great. Thank you, Michelle. So we had, um, yes, uh, the question from Daniel, and I think it will be a perfect segue to our uh, session or working session. Uh, now it's uh, uh, asking for some hints on how to approach the wide possible vari variety of impactful life situations. Uh, and I think Eleanor was already touching on that uh, in, in her last response. Uh, but actually, and, and we can go back to the group map. So we'll put uh, the group map link again in the chat and um, uh, you can all move to it uh, on your side. 
Um, uh, so basically, uh, the thing we will do is to play a little bit with the various impact categories um, or the various impacts to write to use the right language. Eleanor, don't hesitate to correct me on that front. Uh, basically, to play with it, and we will ask you um, not only to um, play with it from your stakeholder hat, but actually for this exercise to for most of you to look at your patient or your caregiver experience and try to see on how you can re reflect your own experience with those, um, uh, with those categories or impacts. Uh, so can we have the question on the screen, please? In the meantime, please make sure you all go back to group map. So before you get to shoot um, comments, ideas, or experience uh, in the boxes, so please take a, a minute to um, uh, what has been your most important experience in terms of patient or, or caregiver. Uh, try to rethink about that uh, example and, and, and try to remember if you felt that the healthcare professionals you were dealing with understood um, your perspective and your experience first. Um, and then um, uh, if, if you have that in mind, then please uh, try to feed the different boxes uh, and wait apply. Um, uh, so that will be the first part of the exercise. So I will let you a bit of time to reflect on your experience and try to fill in a little bit how it match these impacts. And Brett, Michelle, and Eleanor, if you recognize certain things uh, linked to your, your experience, like feel free to comment. Nothing so far in the, ah, uh, yes, finally, in the preference and prioritization. The, the one comment that I have, if I look at, at this populating, is the importance of um, not putting things in discrete boxes um, in terms of the regulators, the payers, the healthcare system. It really is a, for patients and their journey. And, and what I'm seeing um, is that this is a, a seamless um, process and, and seamless meaning that they, they're, they're intertwined and not necessarily bucketable. 
Um, one of the challenges we do have as a regulator, though, um, when we make our decisions is that we see just a snapshot in time. Um, and, and for some of the medical device studies, they may only be six months. So some of the impacts um, may not manifest during the course of a clinical trial at the time when the evidence is being submitted to us. Um, and so with that being said, um, we, you know, we sometimes are challenged to bring these into our decision-making uh, context because of, because of the duration of the study um, and are looking for outcomes that may be more proximal to the actual investigational product because that would be observable within the course of the clinical trial. And I just was curious as people are populating if they could also consider that element too as they're, as they're populating the impacts. And I think it's a really important point because I think what happens is we don't, at a granular level, we, we need to number one, understand what some of these impacts are, but at the more granular level, getting into some of that information about them and understanding them better. And we haven't done a very good job of that because we didn't even understand what we were, what concepts we were supposed to be zeroing in on. And now that we under, can understand these concepts better and can figure out ways to capture them better, we can add to that body of knowledge about, well, this is something that is consistent throughout the journey or it goes up and down throughout the journey um, to have a better understanding of what might or might not change during the course of a trial um, or if there might be other ways of capturing that information um, that could be more useful in the trial design. Do you want to say something? Or? Uh, yeah, just looking at, at what's coming in on the, the preferences um, section, which is really fascinating, and, and I appreciate all the, the ideas and, and concepts. But what occurred to me is, uh, two things occurred to me as I was looking at this. It, it's interesting, and in that this may be related to what Eleanor was just saying. You know, when we talk about differences between um, length of life and quality of life, you know, it kind of gets down to also, what do we mean by quality of life? What are those specific items that contribute to quality of life that are important, that, that are really the objectives of, of care for, for a number of people? And then the other thing that came to mind for me is, you know, we, we have, we kind of assume uh, and rightly so, that preferences are heterogeneous. Not everybody's going to be the same. Not everybody's going to have the same priorities. And it's important, from my perspective, that we capture the range of those priorities, the range of the rates of trade-offs that people are willing to make. Because for some people, in certain circumstances, length of life may be important than quality of life and vice versa. And we have to accept when we listen to what the patient is saying, that's what's important to the patient and not all patients are going to be the same. So those are the two key learnings that I have just, or thoughts that I have just looking at the responses that we're getting. Thank you, Brett. And, and we will move to the next question. Before that, um, I just come, come back to the, the question of, of Daniel and Eleanor, knowing that the blueprint is not done yet and that we have seen the first part of the work, but um, I, I will go to the next question, but in the meantime, you may you can maybe think about, we are actually seeing the variety of impacts uh, on the screen. So what would be next when you face that? Uh, just, uh, I'll come back to you in a minute. I just introduced uh, the next question and I let you reply when people are feeding in the group map. So basically um, building on what you have replied in the previous question, uh, the, what we want to, to know from you now is like, have you had a chance to actually um, report or share this uh, with uh, your physicians or anybody else? Um, uh, and so the two options, yes. Uh, and then um, maybe then start to describe a little bit what was the experience uh, like? Uh, was it, what, how could you describe it from a, practical aspect and then maybe more so more from an emo emotional aspect and if not uh, would you want to do that and can you develop a little bit more uh, how you would like to share your experience uh, if it was not done so you can start uh, filling these two columns uh, and in the meantime I'm coming back to you Eleonore to, to see if you can 
give a little bit of clarity to Daniel. Sure. I think I'd go back to what Brett said. We don't expect for every patient with a particular disease to all report the exact same thing. Um, you know, everyone's life is different. Everyone's life experiences are different. And, um, and, and everyone has, you know, that's the nature of preferences. There, they, there is a variety of them. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there is now a lot more um, emphasis on the rigor of the, of the methodology that gets used to collect the information, but also the rigor of the methodology for getting consensus on the information and for prioritizing that information and for getting patients to say, well, if you really ask me what's most important, these are the things I would tell you are most important or this one, two, or three. And there are methods for being able to get that. And when we use those kinds of methods, we can get um, some level of agreement from a group of patients, uh, large or small, on what is most important to them that we should be zeroing in on. And yes, yeah, some things might get left behind. Some things might fall on the cutting room floor because there um, isn't as much agreement about that particular thing. But it doesn't mean that it's not important to that person. And it's important for that person to have a conversation with their own caregivers about what's important for them to be sure that that caregiver is helping them make the right decision for them. That's a little different than when we want to make decisions about a particular clinical trial where we may have to go with a group of patients telling us what's most important to them. And I would invite Michelle and Brett to talk a little bit more about the, the, that methodological part because I think that is the part that we need to rely on. You said, Brett, you want to, to build on that? I'm not sure Brett is hearing us. Oh, I, Ken, is. I was watching Michelle and I think she was <laughs> may have had been having oh, trouble un unmuting. I wasn't sorry, something there muted. But I'll, I'll let you go right ahead if, if, and I can follow after you. <laughs> So, so methodologically, I think we have a lot of tools, but I, I keep coming back to, I think for being able to implement all of these learnings and, and incorporate all of this information, for me, it comes down to experience and use and case studies and demonstrating impact. Because not only do we need to, I don't wanna say figure out how to do this, but, but demonstrate how to do this and apply principles of how we take the information that has been developed so rigorously and learn how to implement it, but to do it in a way where we can then demonstrate, hey, this, this works. This is how we do it. This is how we have impact. This is how we get the patient voice from the focus group to the actual impact in the end. And so for me, it's all about use cases and case studies and, and demonstrating impact. That's where I think the real value um, shines through. So, you know, I, I wanted to touch on the importance of fit for purpose because, you know, everything doesn't fit every situation. Um, there are certain situations that would require um, you know, case reports, case series are, are useful. And there's other situations where we're going to need aggregated data that is collected in a very structured, robust way and certain, to answer certain questions. Um, and, and I think that's one of the lessons as, as a regulator, we're looking at what's your question and then your method should align your approach, the information you're collecting all should align with answering that question. Um, and not every question is the regulator's question. Um, as I said in my prior comment, you know, there, there's a spectrum of, of stakeholders here. Um, and there are some questions that really need to be uh, measured and addressed and looked at by the healthcare provider. Some of it would be an individual response. And some of it is an aggregated population's response. So I would, I would argue that we should be paying attention to what's fit for purpose as we're thinking about what the solutions are, what the methodologies are, and what we should be measuring, collecting, and analyzing for what purpose. Um, because it really does depend uh, on what we'd like to do and not apply a one-size-fits-all approach um, for what we're doing. 
Thank you. Great input. And, and I'm looking at the time and we have a couple of questions still to go. So I will move on. I just would like to comment. Uh, there is something at least striking to me uh, on, on this visual or the answers that you have put in. Uh, clearly, uh, the number of touch points to give feedback is really, really short uh, in terms of options to give feedback. And then the moment you're out of this touch point, there is no accountability to receive that feedback and to, to transfer that feedback. There is really uh, between the need and the opportunities to share feedback and the reality of where you can actually, actually do it, there is a clear uh, gap there. So that, that was clearly obvious from the response we, uh, you have given. We, we keep the group map open. So if you don't have time to find something now, don't worry, we'll keep it open for at least 24 hours. Uh, so you, you will be able to continue to, to fill in the, the data. Now, shifting a little bit back from your individual patient or caregiver perspective. Um, so um, more with your expertise in the systems or, or your stakeholder position, and that's directly relating to the fit for purpose, but fit for purpose beyond regulatory submission, what it could be. Uh, so please fill in the question and I see you are very fast. And I think we already have quite some examples and, and we will um, move to the, the next question. What's already clear here is that um, uh, there, there is uh, a lot of space for to feed many decision points in health systems, whether it's HTAs, I've seen health politics, policy, uh, clinical trials. Uh, so many examples that are very valid and there is uh, some work uh, within PFMD in collaboration with NHC on uh, what's the common rationale on how to use this patient experience data, who can use it when, and who can, uh, with, with the support of, of which patient expertise and, and patient experience to, to support it. So that's clearly some work that's, uh, that's um, in the pipeline in, in various places uh, today. Uh, next question. Now, if you come to, to the patient engagement open forum, it's also because you are active somehow to some degree in terms of patient experience data, and you have a role to play even indirectly in, in your organization. So what do you think you can do as an individual, having heard what you have heard today uh, or anything else related to this, uh, what could you do moving back to your organization to help progress on this question and that even accelerate the tipping point we have discussed. I think a last question I can take from the Q&A um, uh, quite quickly, Brett, if, if, you, if you can do it, but there's a question from Barry. Uh, so based on your experience, there is a question about are we over-engineering PPI studies? Good question. Um, I think it goes to the issue of fit for purpose. Um, it depends on the question that we are answering um, and I think we need to provide the information that aligns with that question. And in some cases, the simple answer may be better. Uh, but in other cases, there are specific concerns or issues, I would imagine, that the decision maker or the regulator has 
um, where we need to, and, and they could be complex. And, and the complexity I think is going to be reflected in um, you know, the complexity of the decision and the need for information. So that's why um, I think that this concept of fit for purpose should drive the complexity, not the complexity drive the study because it's complex and perceived to be better because it's more complex. Thank you. I'll move directly to the last question, so we remain on time. Um, and so now that uh, you, there is something you would like to do in your organization, is there, based on the previous question, is there anything that would really help you uh, coming from the outside? If you had the magic ones, what could be, what would you do to make the change within your organization? Brett mentioned it was magic uh, earlier. So you have a magic one now. Demonstration of impact, something that comes back very often indeed. Anything else if you have the magic ones? Feedback loop, very important. And I see the link with the patient council as the highest governance body in the organization. Great, here actually you are giving some ideas to organization like PFMD on AC on how we can build some toolkits uh, and um, support the change and support you in making the change in your organization. So please continue to fill in uh, that question that will be used, that will be shared uh, with you, with any organization that would like to use that information. So please continue to share that for the next 24 hours. So um, we, um, we come to an end of the session. So the very first thing I would like to do is to really thanks the speakers uh, for your contribution and the, the, the rich uh, information and actually the demonstration that it's a movement across the globe, it's a movement in devices, in drug development. Uh, and so we try to feed the tipping point analogy. Uh, and so thank you very much for that. Um, we also uh, would like to mention that uh, it was the first session out of four session today and tomorrow in the patient engagement open forum. So we will have um, one on um, uh, the pediatric patient engagement uh, in half an hour from now. Uh, very interesting, very dynamic, completely different from the usual conference you will go to because children are speaking. Uh, and so uh, very interesting angle uh, in that session. We will have tomorrow uh, a session on uh, diversity and inclusion. And finally, a session on digital health with quite some overlap with what we discussed today because there is a, a whole um, discussion about uh, uh, PROMS and um, how it should be articulated. And the link with digital health, uh, we have a, a new AMI project in Europe that will focus on that and they come to present their intention of work and they come to seek even more patient engagement than what they have designed so far. So please come to this session as well. Um, so so what are, you will receive uh, uh, the, um, uh, a survey uh, to tell us more about what you felt about this session. Thank you again for the speakers. Please keep in mind that Jessica was a great architect of this session. So thank you, Jessica, for the work that um, uh, you have done. Uh, we relay that to you. And uh, so thank you, everybody, and have a very good uh, next session as part of the PF. Have a good day. Bye-bye.